From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. How are you Morning. doing today, David? I'm doing great. We have a great show. We do have a great show, and it wouldn't be a great show without the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. Well, you know, we've said great show before, but this one really hits home. I don't know how we keep topping ourselves. Uh, but <laughs> and, you, and, and you can get your money back. If this isn't a great show, you can get your money back. That's right. We'll send that all back to you. By the way, we're all volunteers on the show. David, Steve, me. It gives us freedom, doesn't it? We it didn't does. tell you, Ralph. We didn't tell you. <laughs> Oh, we'll no, tell we're you making later. a ton of money on this, Ralph. Uh, <laughs> I have to tell you. Regular listeners of this program might remember our conversation with Colonel Lawrence Wilkinson last September, who, uh, during the last Bush administration, was Secretary of State Colin Powell's Chief of Staff. And we spoke with Colonel Wilkinson about the Iran nuclear deal. And he contended that it gave the International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors unprecedented oversight of the Iranian nuclear program, which increased the warning time if Iran chose to develop a weapon from a month or two to a full year. It's something that Colonel Wilkerson called a, quote, huge diplomatic achievement. But President Trump, for unspecified reasons, thinks it's a bad deal. And now he has hired as his national security advisor, John Bolton, the war hawk who is ambassador to the United Nations in the Bush White House, who would also like to unravel the Iran nuclear deal. So on the show today, we have invited investigative journalist and historian Gareth Porter, who has written extensively about the Iran nuclear scare and will give us his view on what to expect with John Bolton, who is now the one whispering in Trump's ear or spanking him with a Forbes magazine. I don't know. Either one of those things. Also on the show, we have author activist Julie Wark, who has written a book about basic income, Another subject we have touched on here before, it has the very provocative title, Against Charity, and she's going to be speaking to us from Barcelona, Spain. As always, we will get to the latest real crime news from our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, and if we have time at the end, we'll delve into more of your listener questions. But first, let's find out what to expect from John Bolton. David? Gareth Porter is an independent investigative journalist and historian specializing in U.S. national security policy. Mr. Porter received the 2012 Gellhorn Prize for Journalism for his coverage of the U.S. war in Afghanistan. His latest book is Manufactured Crisis, the Untold Story of the Iran Nuclear Scare. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Gareth Porter. Thank you so much. Glad to be on the show. Thank you. Welcome indeed, Gareth. I want to make clear my view of John Bolton is if he gets into that White House on April 9th, he's going to push for war. His whole career has been bomb, 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 invade, invade, invade. He's still proud of his war criminal role in the invasion of Iraq under George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. He thinks it's still a good thing, even though they blew apart that entire country and cost untold millions of casualties and refugees. I don't know his psychiatric profile, but the view in Washington, from all perspectives, is this guy is going to push for military action, whether it's North Korea, Iran, supporting Israeli aggression, supporting Saudi Arabia aggression in in Yemen. And he's a Yale Law grad, the shame of Yale Law School. And just in the last few weeks, the criticism of Bolton has been mounting a massive editorial by the New York Times entitled, Yes, John Bolton Really Is That Dangerous. That's March 23rd. It's an article in the Washington Times by Bruce Fine, who's a Republican, worked in the Reagan Justice Department, that's titled, Bolton Appointment Should Jolt Congress to Action. That is, he believes legally it is a confirmable post and would have to have hearings in the Senate, which he could not survive. Even a Republican Senate in 2005 denied him the nomination for UN ambassador under George W. Bush, so notorious is his record. And Medea Benjamin has put out an article basically that has 10 reasons to fear John Bolton, March 27th. The American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee has put out a statement opposing 
John Bolton as Trump's national security advisor, including his bigotry against the people of the Arab world and Muslims. He clearly qualifies as an anti-Semite against the Arab peoples, the other anti-Semitism, and growing editorial statements that paint John Bolton as a kind of Dr. Strangelove. And so the quest in our interview today with Gareth Porter is not to just have him make the case, the conservative case, I might add, against John Bolton, but how to stop John Bolton from even taking his post in the White House, where he has 400 staff, the National Security Advisor now, swollen, 400 staff. In most administrations, the National Security Advisor has more power than the State Department. Okay, so Gareth Porter, you wrote this very concise article in the American Conservative, What is the thesis? My thesis is that John Bolton has not only gone on Fox News innumerable times over the years, virtually every time he is on the show, he calls for bombing Iran. But, you know, when he was in the Bush administration as the undersecretary of state who was in charge of Iran policy, he actually did work very closely with Vice President Dick Cheney to maneuver so that the United States government would be in a position to be able to carry out a military strike against Iran, which in his memoirs, he very clearly states that was his objective. He maneuvered both with regard to the International Atomic Energy Agency to try to get rid of the Alberta, who was in charge of the agency at that point, as somebody who was in the way of his plan. And he also maneuvered to try to distribute some aerial photographs that he claimed were showing that Iran was, in fact, experimenting with nuclear weapons-related explosives in its Parchin military site. And he tried to sell that as a way of isolating Iran and positioning the United States to accuse it of having a secret military program. What's interesting about John Bolton is that he doesn't take into account the consequences of his belligerent recommendation for war. It's like, bomb Iran, that'll take care of it. Does he, understand, yeah, that's, that's... does he understand Iran's power, alliance with Russia, its power in that whole area of the world? That's one of the points that I've been making as well. I wish we did have a psychological profile because it does appear that he does not make any connection between the actions that he is calling for, has, has called for repeatedly in the past and is still doing so today, and consequences that would inevitably flow from them, including, of course, as I'm sure you know, he has also called for a first strike against North Korea. He had a Wall Street Journal article making the argument for that. He called it a legal argument, but it had nothing to do with law whatsoever. And in calling for a strike against North Korea, he showed no awareness of the fact that there would be immediate consequences in terms of a North Korean retaliation that could kill hundreds of thousands, possibly millions in South Korea, including tens of thousands of Americans who live there. And even worse, as a Yale law grad, he has no compunction of violating the U.S. Constitution, undeclared wars, federal statutes, the Geneva Conventions, and international law generally. I mean, this guy is a total lawless war criminal. He should be indicted and convicted. Instead, This wild man, Donald Trump in the White House, is putting him in the jackpot seat right next to him. This is an extremely perilous situation, listeners. This is the worst possible scenario. He's replacing General McMaster, who did not want to withdraw from the Iran nuclear accord, which is supported by other major countries, such as Germany, Russia, China, France, because of the consequences of what happens if we do withdraw. And he is out, fired, in a sense, by Trump, and Bolton is in. So let's further elaborate your case, Gareth Porter. And do you think there can be a conservative movement against the appointment of John Bolton in order to make it more politically powerful, along with the liberal progressive opposition to him? Well, first of all, let me talk about the question of lawlessness, which you which you yes, appropriately raised indeed. with regard to Bolton. He represents the apotheosis of this neoconservative position 
that essentially says that international law should have no role in U.S. policy insofar as it would constrain the United States in the use of military force, only if we can simply use it for our own purposes, and that the sole consideration should be essentially the power and sway of the United States and its ability to use military force. And so I think you're absolutely right that he represents a danger, at least in part, because he absolutely refuses to consider any either legal or ethical consideration as part of his presentation of the policy that should be carried out by the United States in the places where the danger of war is the greatest, that is to say, Iran and North Korea. And from that point of view, I've talked about the fact that basically we have a one-man war cabinet there, even apart from Mike Pompeo, who is also a very dangerous character. If it was only Bolton himself with no one else on the scene, it would be extremely dangerous. And I think the combination of Pompeo and Bolton is even more dangerous. And he, so, he he's a bully, too. He's known among his subordinates to be a bully. We're talking about John Bolton. Mike Pompeo is the new Secretary of State. He's very aggressive, too, but not as wild as John Bolton. John Bolton is truly a wild man. I mean, if well, anybody's right. worked with him, I mean, he loses his temper. He throws things around. He shites, shouts expletives. And I don't know how long he would last in the White House because that's a very good point. Yeah, that's because, you know, you know, his, his positions are against the campaign positions of Donald Trump. Explain that. Right. Of course, Donald Trump's campaign positions are not worth very much. I mean, the guy, mm -hmm. you know, absolutely. I mean, campaign positions generally are not worth much. But in the case of Trump, this is the clearest case of somebody who doesn't really take that seriously. I mean, look, I, I think that he perhaps did want to carry out some of his campaign promises. Obviously, he has made a big deal out of the, the wall uh, and so forth, but he is so without any guiding principles, ethical or otherwise, that clearly he forgets about and or simply kicks over the traces of any past commitment to do something, regardless of how important that commitment was, once he is in a situation where somebody else tells him something and he sees a, an advantage in, in simply doing something different. So that shouldn't be a surprise. But I think you were right when you mentioned the psychological profile of Bolton as a bully. You know, he is one of the clearest instances of somebody in the national security world who kicks down and sucks up to the people above him. I mean, that is, you've mentioned how he bullies the people below him, but it's also clear that he butters up the people above him and tells them what they want to hear. And that's what he's done with Trump. We know that already from some of the statements that he's made. Well, you know, I've talked twice with Colin Powell and twice Colin Powell indicated that he finds John Bolton, who was his subordinate when Colin Powell was Secretary of State, as despicable, as a wild man, but he won't speak out publicly. On it. Yeah, that's too which, bad, which, actually. Which I, I mean, wished, which I wished he would, just in order to be patriotic, right? But look at this scenario. He has to have a security clearance. It's going to take months to complete a security clearance, which means Trump is going to have to give him a waiver to get him to the White House and mm -hmm. be his national security advisor. But Trump has given waivers in the past, and they've turned out to boomerang on him. He gave a waiver to his son-in-law, Kushner. He gave a waiver to others because he didn't want to wait for the security clearance. Now, Bolton has a lot of entanglements, domestic, overseas, and a career, a careening career. He also has economic entanglements. It's going to take the FBI months to clear him. And so he's going to have to have a waiver from Trump. And that's one way to interject an opposition to Bolton ever going into the White House to raise that you're issue. Absolutely, everybody, you're absolutely who, right. Who, yeah, everybody who can raise that issue should raise that issue. What other ways would you recommend that could be taken in the next few days to stop him? Well, I think, first of all, I would just follow up on the point you just made about the entanglements that Bolton has gotten himself into over the years. Clearly, this is a man who has attached himself to very wealthy patrons, including Sheldon Adelson, of course, the leading contributor to Trump's campaign, unless it was Mercer who actually gave more. He's also attached himself to Robert Mercer, the two leading figures 
in terms of financial support for Trump, both of whom are extremely controversial for various reasons. Uh, Sheldon Adelson, because he is the, the leading contributor to the, uh, he also was the, the leading contributor to Netanyahu's campaign. He, I mean, he holds that distinction of having contributed to the winning campaigns of both the Israeli and the American chiefs of state. And at the same time, he holds views of, you know, he has called for dropping an atomic bomb on on Iran as a warning to them. <laughs> so he's really, you know, somebody who has no rational viewpoint at all. And, and certainly it would pay to call for an investigation, to demand an investigation of the ties between Bolton and Adelson to find out how much money has passed from Adelson to Bolton, for what purpose, and also the same thing, of course, for Mercer. That would be my starting point for trying to throw sand in the gears of this process. It's generally believed in, in all political circles here in Washington that he couldn't survive a Senate confirmation hearing. Even the, the Republicans, enough Republicans would vote against him. He terrifies the Republicans. And he may be a political peril to Trump himself. I mean, does Trump know what he's getting into? Bringing this well, human... probably not. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. Trump probably does not understand what he's getting into with Bolton. He's had conversations with Bolton, and Bolton has managed to pull the wool over his eyes and has buttered him up, obviously. I mean, that's the way you get into the good graces of Donald Trump. And Bolton understands that. And clearly, he's a very good a butterer and knows exactly how to tell Donald Trump that he's brilliant and that, you know, he's going to help him do exactly what he wants to do. So, I mean, I think that really looking at ways that you can raise issues in Congress that could be the basis for opposition is really the next phase after you've made the demand that, you know, the, the investigation of his security clearance has to look at his ties with very wealthy patrons and what he may have given up in the process of making those connections with these wealthy men that would be relevant to this investigation. And by the way, Congressman Bill Foster, and he's going to get others to join him. He's a Democrat from Illinois. He's introduced a bill to make the National Security Advisor explicitly a confirmable post by the Senate. Bruce Fine, as I said, a Republican in the Justice Department under Reagan, we're going to have him on the show very soon where he makes a very powerful argument that it is already a confirmable post. He says, quote, the appointments clause of the Constitution militates against the national security advisor aberration, namely that it isn't confirmable. It makes Senate confirmation of, quote, officers of the United States, end quote, that's from the Constitution, the rule. But Congress may, by statute, can create exceptions for, quote, inferior officers, end quote. But it has not done so for the National Security Advisor position in the White House, even assuming the office qualifies as, quote, inferior, end quote. But I had a personal experience to show the nefariousness and the danger of John Bolton's agenda. He under the George W. Bush regime, when he was under Secretary of State Colin Powell, just as a wildcatter, said that Fidel Castro was developing chemical and biological weapons. And it was a lie. And the State Department took it back. And in the meantime, he wanted to fire two of his subordinates in the State Department, Bolton, who said it was not true. So he, he puts out this lie and a few weeks later, I happened to be in Cuba, and I was interviewing Fidel Castro. And Castro said that he thought that statement by Bolton was a precursor to a U.S. invasion of Cuba. Because mm -hmm, at that mm -hmm. time, you know, it was the axis of evil. They were into hitting the drumbeats to invade Iraq. They were going after Iran and North Korea. That's how dangerous he is. He puts out a lie, and it has to be overridden by his superior. And he never expresses any regret for the lie. Yeah, so clearly. we're, we're mean, talking he, here with someone that is about as antagonistic to conservative values as progressive. And what kind of conservative reaction have you had to your article, Gareth Porter, in the American Conservative <laughs> Magazine, which I recommend people reading? 
Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked that question because, in fact, the article that I wrote for the American Conservative, I believe it was published the day of the announcement that he would be the national security advisor, has gotten, I believe now it's 6,400, if I'm not mistaken, likes on the page at the American Conservative Online. That's a lot of, a lot of interest. And I think that it bespeaks a very considerable demand on the part of readers of the American conservative for that kind of information and of great interest in the issue of John Bolton as a threat to peace. And that's because the American conservative represents what is often called paleoconservatism, which is a point of view that tends to be oriented towards religion tends to be of the persuasion represented by Senator Robert Taft back in the 40s and early 50s, anti-interventionist, not militarist, in fact, anti-militarist, and suspicious of policies that lead in that direction. So this is a source definitely of support for moves that, such as you're talking about, which would try to get Congress to see the real danger of John Bolton in the White House as National Security Advisor and take some action against it. They can immediately pass a joint resolution of Congress saying that John Bolton is unfit for the office and a clear and present danger to the United States of America because he's so radical. He will provoke retaliation back into this country. You know, our country has been viewed as Fortress America, bolstered by two giant oceans and unreachable. But we now know after 9-11, we're no longer unreachable. And this kind of Bolton aggression can boomerang with all kinds of attacks coming back to this country. So if people think, well, it's just those people overseas, you know, who cares? They better think twice. And the real immediate conflict, I think, Gareth Porter, is that Secretary of Defense Mattis has said privately he can't work with Bolton. And what if he calls President Trump up and says, it's either me or Bolton. What is Trump going to do? And if Trump says, well, well I'm keeping very... Bolton, we got a first yeah. class crisis in this country. Well, I think you've just pointed to one of the other issues here that people should be aware of, which is that the U.S. military leadership and Mattis as Secretary of Defense are definitely not only not interested in a war against Iran or North Korea, they are certainly dead set against war in both cases. And as you've suggested, there will be a conflict between Mattis, as well as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Bolton over these issues. So I think that is indeed a basis for going to, to Congress, activists going to Congress and saying, look, you need to intervene here on behalf of the sane people that are left within the administration and support those people against Bolton, both through investigation, having hearings on this, as well as, as you suggest, having a resolution that deals with the danger of Bolton to world peace and to the interests of the United States. Well, listeners, get in touch with your senators and representatives. We're looking forward to a headline, even if Bolton gets into the White House on April 9th, in the coming days after that. We're looking for a headline that says, John Bolton bolted from the White House by Donald Trump because there's no room for both of them in the White House. Any last words for our listeners? Gareth Porter, well, you yes, covered I, the war I, in Afghanistan. Any last words? I just want to say that I, I do think that this is the, the moment of greatest peril in terms of a very serious war being carried out by the United States simply because of Bolton and Pompeo and Trump, that combination is something that we have not seen in the White House in, in any administration since World War II. And I think that should motivate people to take action in a way that nothing that we've seen so far has. Well, a very moderate columnist for the Washington Post, David Ignatius, a few weeks ago even said, the hawks are ascending at the State Department the completion of this triumvirate of warmongers could be if, if Secretary Mattis quits and Donald Trump appoints Pompeo Secretary of Defense, Nikki Haley from the UN mm. to Secretary of State, and John Bolton, get ready for war. I'm telling the reporters that I'm talking to in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, you better start figuring how you're going to hire more war correspondents. Worst case scenario, I agree. 
Thank you very much, Gareth Porter, for your article, your thoughts, your past reporting achievements. Read his article on the American Conservative. Consider even subscribing to the American Conservative. It has true conservative doctrine, not corporatist doctrine, at its core in the articles and editorials that they give their readers. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Ralph. We've been speaking to investigative journalist and historian Gareth Porter. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now let's find out what's going on in the wonderful world of international corporate crime. With our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, you are listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Back in a minute. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Thursday, March 29, 2018. I'm Russell Mokhyber. President Donald Trump says he wants to go after Amazon. I have stated my concerns with Amazon long before the election, President Trump tweeted. Unlike others, they pay little or no taxes to state and local governments, use our postal system as their delivery boy, and are putting many thousands of retailers out of business, Trump tweeted. The tweet comes one day after Axios reported that Trump hates Amazon. He's obsessed with Amazon, Axios reported. What we're hearing, Amazon said, Trump has talked about changing Amazon's tax tax treatment because he's worried about mom-and-pop retailers being put out of business. He's wondered aloud if there may be any way to go after Amazon with antitrust or competition law. Trump's real estate buddies tell him, and he agrees, that Amazon is killing shopping malls and -and brick-and-mortar retailers. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. And our next guest, who thinks charity is not really a gift. David? Julie Wark is an Australian Spanish citizen and a resident of Barcelona for 27 years. She's a translator of novels, essays, short stories, poetry, and exhibition catalogs, a long-term human rights author activist, and is on the editorial board of Sin Permiso, a Spanish-language magazine of international politics. She is the co-author, along with Daniel Raventos, of Against Charity where they argue for an unconditional universal basic income above the poverty line and paid for by progressive taxation. She's speaking to us from Barcelona. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Julie Wark. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you. Yes, indeed, Julie Wark. You're going to provoke our listeners, I'm sure, with your thesis, because a lot of people think that Charity and universal basic income are not incompatible. And before we get to the universal basic income issue, let me ask you this question. Do you distinguish between organized and plutocratic level charity, noblesse oblige, and individual charity extended to people, for example, in one's neighborhood, one's church, one's service club, from one to another, whether to poor people, veterans, people with disabilities? Do you distinguish between those two? Yes, I do. I think that there's a big difference between organised plutocratic charity, which by definition is uh, the plutocratic part is is top down and it's an extremely unequal relationship and more business oriented when you look at philanthro capitalism. But individual charity is much closer to kindness or closer to in the etymological sense of kin and community and for example I read a piece you wrote about how your father took you on a drive around the community to see the work of local philanthropists and I think that this is much closer to the original sense of philanthropy meaning love for humanity but the idea of philanthro capitalism distorts that meaning because you know with the capitalism incorporated it becomes about making profits. And I think that philanthropic capitalism has five disturbing features which clearly distinguish it from the local community sense of charity or good works, let's say, because I think charity, is, you know, it's, this is very difficult to make a clear definition, but philanthropic capitalism uses a business approach to development which it's supposed to aid through charity and it stresses quantitative things, measuring results and impact. Second, these foundations have a huge influence in political agenda, so they're anti-democratic. Um, George Soros, I'll quote him, he says, I indulge in political philanthropy. I try to use my money to influence how governments spend money. Now, that for me is not very democratic. 
Third, global governance is greatly weakened by the anti-democratic influence of entities like the Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, UN Foundation, because they call the shots in global partnership. And fourth, there's an absence of transparency and accountability mechanisms. So, for example, if 200,000 Indian farmers committed suicide between 19 or this century or this decade as a result of externally imposed agricultural policy, nobody was responsible to the families or communities. And finally, philanthropic capitalism is a power relationship in which recipients have little or no say in how they're to be helped. And it's at a distance where in the community, for example, you know, people participate more in the charitable enterprise. Well, I think that after listening to you, it's quite clear that this is in a broad tradition of concentrated corporate power. That is, they seize agendas that look good and turn the agenda upside down. For example, yes. when everybody got the vote, nobody would dream that corporations would turn that against the very voters by yeah, money exactly. and politics and other ways of manipulating people, <clears throat> voter suppression, discrimination against certain classes of voters. So this is really in the tradition. Starts out, let's say, for Christians as Christian charity or for Muslims as uh, giving alms for the poor and a certain percentage of one's income back to the poor. And now these global corporations or these big corporations have turned it into a business. And so let, let's delve into this. In the U.S., the tax laws say that a corporation can give up to 5% of its taxable income to charity and deduct it. Most yes. corporations don't even get to 1%, by the way. Mm. But some do get to 3 4%. So that's a technique that socializes part of the cost on the backs of general taxpayers because they can deduct the charity, reduce their income tax, send less tax revenues to the treasury, and, of course, that is socialized on the backs of all taxpayers. So have you gone into that? That is, they actually have moved to a second stage of making a lot of their charitable contributions profitable. And I'm not even getting into the intricacies of the tax laws where these giant multi-billionaires and corporations can actually, in some instances, Julie Wark, make a profit by producing charitable contributions. So miasmic is our U.S. tax law. Can you give us some observations on that? Well, we have a chapter in the book which is called A Munificence of Malfeasance, which is about how tax laws can be used as a dodge and how there's quite a lot of information which I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but for example, I can give you one in the case of humanitarian funding in Haiti. There's a, a very good report in which 94% of the funding for Haiti aided intermediaries like the donors' own entities, UN agencies, the big NGOs, and also the donors' contractors, which is the same as what happened in, the, in reconstruction efforts. And Condoleezza Rice, after the tsunami in Southeast Asia in 2005, notoriously said that this worked very well for American interests. I forget the exact quote, but it was, you know, they see it as, and, and of course, Naomi Klein has documented the iniquitous way in which these organizations come in and profit from other people's disasters. Yes, it's, but, you know, a billionaire can set up a, a tax free charitable trust to give his kids a lifelong job and salary. There's no estate tax due on the donation. So it's much bigger than just, it's, you know, 5% seems reasonable, but there's a lot of fraud and abuse in the United States, in Great Britain, in Australia, and Spain is not, we didn't study the situation in Spain because we're corrupt enough without worrying about charities as well. You know, basically, yes, it's um, the, the tax situations and loopholes. The Britain's Cup Trust is another one which they borrow money, use it to purchase bonds and then sell, but it all comes under their donors' gifts. But it's very complicated and it's a horrible world to enter into, in fact. Well, corporate charity is an instrument of power. It really knows no boundaries. You know, you have these drug companies who are selling these opiates and uh, thousands of people every year in the United States are dying. And now they're offering uh, support for the antidotes to be distributed. 
So yeah. again and again, they create the problem, the toxic pollution, the product defects, and then they try to either sell products or make charitable contributions to deal with the tragedies, and they get away with it. Let's yeah. talk about the Gates Foundation. Now, this is the mm. biggest foundation in the Western world. It runs maybe $40, $50 billion in assets and is very big in educational so-called reform. It's very big in infectious diseases overseas, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and it's moving into other areas. It is viewed very much as top-down. They give $50 million segment type grants very often, and it's not quite clear how many strings they have attacked, but there's no there's no doubt that this is a very, very hierarchical, top-down foundation. What did you write about on that in your book? We're talking, by the way, with Julie Wark, who's a co-author with Daniel Raventos, of the book Against Charity, which has been published by Counterpunch in California that publishes books that are completely uncensored and uh, often are too controversial for the big (laughs) publishers. Uh, It's a very clearly written book, very uh, stimulating book. It makes you think about your own experiences, which we'll get to in a minute in terms of personal charity. But let's talk about the big foundations and and focus on the the Gates Foundation. Well, let's start with Bill to begin with. He's one of the richest men in the world, and he feels it's perfectly fine to take sand from a Caribbean island to replenish his private beach every so often and to live in a house called Shanadu Point 2 with, I think, 26 kitchens or something. Now, this incredible difference between a donor and the people he gives to is really obscene to begin with, in my view. But to get to the political question about a foundation like the Bill Gates Foundation is that he can nudge state and global funding towards any area he wishes to prioritise. So, for example, at the World Health Organisation, one staffer has said that hardly any major policy decisions are taken without being, quote, vetted by Gates Foundation staff. And in fact, the Gates Foundation was the World Health Organization's second biggest donor in 2014. And its donations are, quote, earmarked, which is another way of saying that it influences World Health Organization policy. So, for example, it's much praised for its work on malaria, particularly in Ethiopia. But the quid pro quo of that is that Bill Gates hates public health. He says it's a waste of time and a waste of money, public health services. So he comes in with his mosquito nets, but then people overlook the fact that these mosquito nets are drenched with insecticides, which has to be replenished every so often. And this is a, insecticides are part of another Bill Gates business, which I think can probably be taken back to Monsanto. Or, for example, the polio program in Nigeria. In fact, there are other diseases which are much easier to treat with a good public health system in Nigeria than polio. But Bill Gates has decreed that it has to be polio that's treated in Nigeria and not other more easily treatable and more widely spread diseases. But, I mean, there's another thing. If the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is aiding the hungry billions, well, how does it do it? It invests, and it invests in equities and securities in financial markets like Saudi Arabia, which is creating the biggest humanitarian crisis we have now in Yemen, and all sorts of companies that are destroying the environment, like Dow Chemical. He's also investing in student loan financing firms, which affects education, even though he's supposed to be supporting education. And then, for example, to go on to his work on climate change, quotes, he's investing in oil companies like Conoco, Chevron, Texaco, BP, and companies that are not only polluters, but they're human rights violators as well, like Kermagi, for example, or Rio Tinto, or Vale. Also, um, I just to interrupt, he's also a big supporter of genetic engineering in agriculture and the yeah, uh, totally. bi- biotech, uh, yeah, another, yeah, biotech yeah, industry, is, Monsanto. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, he yeah, likes to talk what... about evidence-based philanthropy, but he ignores all kinds of evidence, including a whole new generation of virulent weeds that have come up to nullify the effect of a GMO crop, so-called efficiency. Yeah, he makes no bones about it, by the way. You know that. I mean, he says he's using his billions of dollars to 
shape or reshape government priorities in the Gates Foundation image. So he makes yes, no exactly. bones about it. Exactly, exactly. It's really terrifying. And then when you get people like Peter Singer, who is the guru of altruism, or what he calls effective altruism, which is a very utilitarian notion, saying, you know, you've got to give your money where the bucks bang best, give it to the Bill Gates Foundation. And what these people do is then they come into a kind of superstar status where everybody hangs on every idiot and stupid thing that comes out of their mouths because they're celebrities. And this is part of this is why we included the chapter on celebrity culture, because I think it's extremely dangerous. Well, not uh, only because of the inequality gap that they represent, but because of the influence of people who are considered to be wise because they're rich and well dressed and attend celebrity galas. It's, in your book against charity, let's let's go into the murky grey areas. Let's take two examples: a massive national mobilization to help other countries that are experiencing disasters like tsunamis and earthquakes. And the second is nonprofit hospitals providing free care for people who come in in an emergency basis to have their lives saved. Mm -hmm. Where are you on those? Well, just to give you an example of the, the first one, I went to East Timor two months after it was destroyed by Indonesian militia in, at the end of 1999. And I went twice, in fact, in those months and uh, trying to find a project that could be funded by the Catalan government. And in this case, it was very, very difficult to find what, because all of the NGOs working there were working with World Bank projects, all supervised from outside. But the image that stayed in my mind was of East Timorese people whose houses, because 70% of the infrastructure was destroyed, people sleeping in plastic bag tents on the beach next to the floating hotel which had jacuzzis, salsa bars, all the rest of it, plus hardship allowances for the NGO workers. And a lot of those people were really good people, but they were in a system where they couldn't do anything. What we managed to do, and this was a personal initiative, I went with a friend from here and we paid our own way in the end. And we went, we found an area that was a rice growing area where the buffalo had been killed by the Indonesians as a way of stopping food production because the buffaloes were essential to the rice production. And the easy thing to do was simply replace the buffaloes. Now, there were buffaloes up in the mountains where people had hidden them, but they weren't thriving because there wasn't enough space for them and they were not in the right environment. So the thing was just to walk the buffaloes down the mountains. So you're, um, you're not against the idea of no, cross-national... No, it's, it's, it's the way it's done. It's the way it's done. And also, I mean, it has to be done by the local people who know. We would never have known if we hadn't traveled to the end of the island, spoken with the local people and discovered that there were these buffaloes up the mountain. So with a relatively small amount of money, we were feeding 20,000 people in two years. Or they well, were feeding, not we. It, was not, it wasn't us. We just found the money to pay for the buffaloes, to walk them down, to get the basic agricultural equipment and get this rice project up again. The sad thing is that the Catalan government, after four years, cut off the funding because of internal Catalan political problems. The new government didn't want to fund the program, which had been funded by the old government. So there's always external political things influences. But the other thing is, as for your hospital, I think, yes, I mean, in itself, it's a good thing. But I do think that health care should be part of what's supplied to citizens with rights in the public sphere, which is why Danny and I are in favour of basic income, the left wing version of basic income, precisely because it's universal and mm -hmm. it meets one of the basic human rights. Well, we'll so, get to that in just a moment. So you know, just to clarify for our listeners, you're not against immediate emergency charities, individual no, or national disasters. Central, you, you just want to have a different type of economy, which we'll get to in a minute, that makes it unnecessary. I mean, when I was campaigning for president, I had a constant refrain. I said, a society that has more justice is a society that needs less charity. And I'd give examples, yes. and the audience would applaud, but I don't think I got many votes on that, which we'll get to in a minute, because you can have the best, you can have the best idea. If you don't have civic motivation, yes. you're not going to get a base to get it installed. You remember Eugene Debs 
in the latter yes, years of his, yes. yeah, you remember in the latter years of his fight for working people in America. This is in the 1920s. Was asked by a reporter what his greatest regret was, and he said, "My greatest regret, my greatest regret is the American people under the Constitution can have almost anything they want, but it just seems like they don't want much of anything at all." Before we get into the basic income. A personal question. Do you or your co-author, Daniel Raventos, give money to charities? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. But General Achebe, the marvelous Nigerian author, in one of his novels, The Anthills of Savannah, says something very similar. He says, while we do our good works, let's not forget that the real solution lies in a world in which charity will have become unnecessary. Yeah. So it's close to what you said. No, your question about the charity, no, I don't give to corporate charities. I do give to people in the street. And I find it's a very uneasy relationship because I always feel it's very unequal. I find it's arbitrary on my part because I, it depends what I've got in my purse. It depends if I'm in a hurry. It depends if I'm in a good mood or a bad mood. So I find it a very uncomfortable relationship. I don't give to the big charities for the reasons that I've outlined. How about the, the Salvation book. Army, which is quite different than the Red Cross? No, I don't give to the Salvation Army. No, I prefer... What I've done is to try to make my contribution to society by working for five decades now in human rights. And I began as an Indonesia activist. And no, no, my... we're not denying you that role, Julie yeah. Wark. We're just this, you can, we can all engage in multitasking. When I walk by a street fundraiser, which I prefer to call them, yeah, yeah. I ask them, how are things? Most people don't have any change. They got credit cards and debit cards. They don't yes, have any change. I, no, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to justify myself, but I'm saying that this is how I see no. this question of how could you contribute to a society where, yes. which is so unequal and so many people are in distress. As for Danny, I don't think he gives to charities, but he's a very kind person, a very decent person, and I think he would probably see his work in universal basic income, for which he really works hard, as a kind of, you know, his contribution yes. to society. All right, let's, let's talk about to... the basic income, because, you know, time is short, obviously, but this is the main thrust in the book, Against Charity. And it's a book you should read because it really is very personal impact on the readers when you read it. And you make a strong case for universal basic income, as many people have throughout history, some of them called conservatives, some called liberals. The conservatives usually support it because they want to replace other what they call welfare state programs like food stamps or energy bill assistance or housing assistance, etc. And the liberal progressives, they support it because... It is a main way to achieve more freedom, dignity, and justice in a society. It's also more efficient in terms of consumer demand. It has a lot of pluses, psychological pluses, reduces the dread, fear, anxiety in a society, and it reduces the mortification of having to have your hand out for conditions you're not at fault in producing personally. So here's the argument I would make in addition to yours. In Western countries especially, having a universal basic income, which is you know, to take everybody above the poverty level, and mm -hmm. uh, no means testing, uh, very simple, you just give people money. Yeah, um, universal unconditional, yes. Yes. The best argument for it is the definition of plutocracy is mass theft. That is, huh. they are taking from people who have earned it an adequate wage because of their political power. Hmm. They have taken from people who own it the wealth of our public lands, minerals, timber, grazing, much of which is bargain basement prices to the big corporations to exploit, or they get it free. In our country, corporations get hard rock minerals found on federal lands free. They get gold free, hmm. they get silver free, they get lead free, libdium free. And the other thing is massive corporate bailouts from ordinary taxpayers who pay yeah. it. So well, you so add all yeah. these up. You're talking far more than a basic income funding base. You're talking reciprocity. You're basically yeah. saying, yeah. look, all these people are being forced politically through the corporate state and the power of corporations over media, et cetera, education system, never talking about the commons, what people own, the great wealth, the public lands, mm. the public, mm. the you know, broadcast airwaves, the subsidies, R&D for medical breakthroughs, for Silicon Valley breakthroughs, that they never hear about this. 
And this is just a return of capital that they earned. And that's the, that's the argument. Then yeah, you don't have to get into, oh, years. we don't want to raise taxes. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's too difficult. It's radical. What about that argument of reciprocity, return of unearned wealth? Yeah, this is an argument we have used, in fact, because our position is democratic-republican tradition, which we can take right back to Aristotle, even though he was an oligarchic Republican. But the idea is that, you know, our idea is that it's not a question of replacing or weakening the welfare system, but the welfare system could be greatly strengthened by the fact that a lot of the surveillance Mm. mechanisms would not be necessary anymore with a universal basic income. And the other thing is that it's a question of social justice because if you think that if we are human and we we believe in human rights, then the basic human right of all is the right to exist. But the problem is that with charity, human rights don't come into the picture. So if we're going to worry about human rights in which all people have rights, and I'll just give a parenthesis here, a shocking statement by the Belgian interior minister to the Greek minister for immigration a year ago was, let them drown, speaking of refugees, break the law. I don't care if they drown. Now, we're living in a world where refugees are being warehoused, where people where now in the Mediterranean, a rescue boat was accused of people trafficking when they're rescuing. As you said before, everything is completely upside down. But if we start thinking universally in the basic income, it's not a universal panacea, but it's a start by guaranteeing the right to existence of every single person in the world, which would be ideal. Of course, Danny and I are not, we act hopelessly. We don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime, but we also think that we should fight for it because I don't see any other program which has this universal emphasis on that we all belong to a one human family. And even more, Naomi Klein mentions this in her last book, is that we have a responsibility for the planet. And how can we as human beings try to protect this planet, which we're destroying so quickly, if half the human beings don't have enough to eat or to live on? You're making so the, you're making a very another... powerful case that's been made by justice seekers all over the world, philosophers going back to ancient Greece and of course theologians. I'm making another point. I'm saying that when you start getting a public debate on this and it moves toward the area of electoral politics and political agendas, you make a much stronger case when you demand the return of massive wealth that's taken by the plutocracy, by the rich and powerful, from the people every day that belongs to the people, like the public lands, or that is already earned but not paid to the people. That's a much more, you see, that is a much more powerful argument than getting into how do you finance Mm -hmm. it, you're going to have to raise taxes. And when people hear the raise taxes, they think it's going to be raised on them, even though you tell them it's going to be a a transaction tax on Wall Street, etc. But, but you know, your argument, I don't know if you've seen Yanis Varoufakis, who's a basic income supporter, this is his argument as well. It's about giving back, because, you know, it's basically the same argument. It's about justice. This is a justice side about the argument. But, we, you know, there's different aspects. One is the three basic... For me, I mean, I'm a human rights activist and a human rights theoretician in a certain sense. So for me, the three things are freedom, justice, and and human dignity. But all of those, uh, your argument would fit in with the justice aspect. Yes, of course, of course, we have, you know, the commons. And it was also, you're also talking mm-hmm. about, you know, it's not charity that we need. It's more, it's, it's justice, which is an, another... I really example. want to make the point. You're arguing very powerfully in one gigantic historical-based arena. But I'm saying you don't use the word giving back. You use the word that the rich and powerful have got to return stolen goods from the people. Mm -hmm. Stolen Mm -hmm. goods that either belong to them or they've earned it, but they haven't Mm -hmm. been paid for it. Just to highlight the importance of this book, listeners, here are some of the chapters in Praise of Kindness, depictions, good examples, Charity is not a gift, religion, love, and property, effective, useful altruism, celebrities, that's a real good one, that chapter, Mm -hmm. a munificence of malfeasance, bleeding need, a short history of humanitarianism, basic income, not charity, but justice, justice and how to finance it, 
This is quite a book. It's uh, published by Counterpunch in California. It's called Against Charity, Daniel Raventos and Julie Wark. It should be widely read. It's out in paperback. Go for it, listeners. Any last quick thoughts, Julie? No, I'd just like to say thank you. I've really enjoyed talking with you. I was a bit nervous to begin with, but it's been very enjoyable. And thank you very much for the nice things you said about the book. And thank you, because we're going to try to make this universal basic income a topical subject for some candidates in the November election coming up this year in the United States. And I'll bear in mind your argument as well. So I think you're right emphasizing that from the political perspective. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you to your colleagues for making the connection. You're you're quite welcome. I hope you get on Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! program very soon. Oh, wow. That would be be too much. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. We have been speaking to author activist Julie Wark. Her book is Against Charity. Mm. We will link to that at ralphnaderradiohour.com. I want to thank our guests again today, journalist historian Gareth Porter and author activist Julie Wark. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. For Ralph's weekly column, go to nader.org. For more from Russell Moe Kyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. And visit the American Museum of Tort Law and go to tortmuseum.org and check out the Tort Museum Bookstore for engrossing books and memorabilia. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, is written and performed by Kemp Harris. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you all. Get active, listeners. I hope we've given you something to do. Hello, podcast listeners. This is Jimmy Lee Wirt, the producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, with this week's wrap-up. This week, Ralph answers a listener question, but first, Steve asks a question of Gareth Porter about the consequences of war. I have just a comment that either one of you can uh, jump in on. It seems very ironic to me that just last year we were saying about Donald Trump, oh, great, he's surrounding himself with generals, which in another era would be weird because we'd be afraid of that. And now the general's influence seems to be falling away. And now it's time to be really afraid of people who have no sense of the consequence of war. Like Right. And and, and I would just say very quickly that I think you're, you're correct. And the reason is that you know, the the real threat of what we're talking about now is with Iran and with North Korea, both of whom can take very strong, decisive military action in retaliation. And the U.S. Pentagon and the military understand that. They're opposed to that. Those folks like their small wars around the Middle East and elsewhere. They want to continue that as long as possible, but they do not want the big war. And And I think that's why we have that contradiction now. Right. Colonel Wilkerson told us it would take half a million troops, 10 years to bring it in under any kind of control and probably 100,000 casualties in the first 30 days. Absolutely right. That is the standard view in the military. And now Ralph answers a listener question. Okay, Ralph, we have a question here from listener Elizabeth Axtell, and it's about checks and credit cards. And this is what she says. She says, when I make contributions to organizations, I only send checks. I do not use my credit card. However, when many progressive organizations on their websites or in their emails ask her for donations, they want to make her use her credit card or PayPal. And she doesn't want to use either. This discourages her from giving. And she wants you to comment on that. Elizabeth, I do exactly the same thing. I only send checks to various nonprofit groups that do good works in the environmental consumer justice area. I don't have a credit card. I don't have a debit card. And so I am not incarcerated in the debit card, credit card payments gulag. And the argument you make to these groups that you want to donate to is why do they want you to use something like PayPal, which takes three, three and a half percent from the top of your donation? Why would they want to lose three, three and a half percent 
to the credit card companies. That's the argument. When you send them a check, they keep 100% of what you donate. I don't think they have an answer to that other than indifference. Well, thank you for your question, Elizabeth. Keep those questions coming either on Ralph's Facebook page or on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website or on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Facebook page. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and be sure to tune in next week. Stand up.